be good, or the Kimbers will come and get you. Little Casey Lennox could be a mean one. That Asian girl was outright shaking in fear from the name. The Dillashaw girl stepped up behind Casey, gave her a good yank on the ponytail. Don't be a bitch, Case. Ow, 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 snorted Lennox. The Dillashaw girl turned to the little one. Don't worry about him, Sydney. That one's dead and buried. You've got nothing to worry about from him. Casey Lennox was just entering her teen years, her first smattering of acne cropping up on her face like someone had thrown a bucket full of grease at her. She shot up a good three inches this past winter and was starting to dress like all the teenage girls do when they first start noticing boys. God knew, Penelope herself caked herself in makeup and wore huge hoop earrings at that age. The three girls were wandering about the market, taking their time looking at different shops and booths. They were unarmed, except for Eunice Dillashaw, the eldest, who had a dagger at her belt. Before long, they'd be at Penelope's booth. She hoped their chaperone caught up with them before then, or at least that the 15-year-old Eunice had some sense to her. "'What about the panther?' asked Sydney, the Asian girl. "'Or that one that killed the worm?' "'No one killed a worm,' reported Eunice, somewhat sharply, then soft added. "'Worms don't exist, Sid.' "'Oh, I think they're out there,' piped Casey. "'I've heard them in the night.' Then she took a wide stance, squatted down a little, and bellowed a deep growl from her diaphragm. <laughs> Eunice just rolled her eyes at this, patted Sydney on the shoulder, but said nothing. Now they approached Penelope's booth. She sold used books, crammed into boxes labeled romance, sci-fi, thriller, slash suspense, slash highwaymen, non-fic history, and others. Everything down to cookbooks and autobiographies and new age spiritual books on shamanism and finding your spirit animal. But her main sales, indeed what she had laid out neatly on the table behind which she sat, was comic books. These were easy to produce, with staples instead of binding and glue, and as such they weren't second-hand, dog-eared old tomes with yellowing pages. Some of them came off presses in the suburbs of Perth. She had one or two Black Fox issues right off the press in Montana, and a few of them were put together not far from here in a basement printing press near Sir Samuel. That's how she was going to make her money. Of course, Case Lennox immediately picked up one of the comics, bypassing a couple of the old history books on the Battle of Hawaii and the eradication of the Caliphate, and the romance novel with washboard abs on the cover. No, she went straight for the Breastbinder comics. One of the ones, of course, from Penelope's contact near Sir Samuel. Boxy Breastbind in the Mad Con's Menagerie, issue number three. Penelope had read that one. Dialogue was kind of stilted. The history, where it touched on the Chagatai Rebellion, was completely wrong. And, of course, it inserted a 20-something badass check into a conflict from 15 years ago. She liked the artwork that Mulholland produced, but Cannon went completely out the window with that kid. Is this one of the ones where Princess Olje has six arms and spider fangs? Sidney asked to Casey, who by now had flipped open the front cover. Penelope blinked, came back to herself. No, she suddenly realized. That was an issue that showed MB in the Mad Con's harem, complete with lusty interludes with Illigay's concubines, nipple-sucking, and the sort of things little girls like Casey Lennox and Sidney Wang probably shouldn't be looking at yet. Uh, Penelope suddenly blurted, unsure of what to do just then. She was somewhat transfixed with concern. Thankfully, Eunice Dillashaw snatched the comic out of Casey's hands. Eunice was a little older, and even though she was still a little young to be seeing the sort of thing Mulholland put in there, at least it might not piss all over her innocence. Miss Humberton, Eunice asked, flipping through a few pages, is this one of the ones that... And she trailed off, having flipped to another page and clearly having answered her question. Eunice looked at it for a second. Penelope still had that urge to reach out and rip the comic from her hand. Eunice said presently, Case, I'll buy you this one in a few years, when you're a little older. Thank you, Ms. Dillashaw, Penelope said, using the adult method of address. Casey looked irritated. Is there more wanking in that one? Eunice shot her a cold stare. You're not supposed to know what that is. Well, ah, ah! Eunice was pulling at her ponytail again. She handed the comic over to Penelope. Sydney was looking confused. Uh, what's... I'll explain when you're older, came a new voice. Penelope's gaze jerked up to the booth's entrance. She felt her face flush, her ears warm, and not just because she was holding what was essentially sensual art and had three underage girls at her table. Moxie Carver strode in. This woman, not Eunice, was clearly the girl's minder for the day. She was, as usual, armed to the teeth, a thousand-dollar bow over her shoulder, finely forged scimitar at her hip, a dagger at her calf. Penelope always felt... embarrassed, uncomfortable around Ms. Carver, and not just because the woman was the definition of a cold shoulder, but if there was ever any woman that... No. Moxie Breastbine was a fictional character, and was named that because she had Moxie, Spunk, Brass, not because she was based off a real woman who bound her chest and executed state officials. Carver stepped up behind the girls. Sydney, there's no such thing as worms, she said, her voice soft, reassuring the child. Eunice, don't use the word bitch, it's unladylike. How long had Miss Carver been observing this exchange? Casey furrowed her brow. The girl was clearly irritated. She wasn't going to get her comic, and Penelope knew from her recent training sessions with Kelly that the Lennox girl was going to become quite the comic nerd in her teens. 
The girl looked at Carver, spat, I've heard you use the word ca-. Two of Oxy's fingers were suddenly pinned on the girl's lips, shushing her. Calmly, Carver said, when you're all grown up, no one's going to pull your hair for those words, and you can make your decisions freely then. Eunice grinned, reached over, and gave one more quick tug at the girl's ponytail. Yeah, you B-word. As Carver turned to the door, Penelope caught sight of the craftsmanship of the bow. Beautifully made, the name Kutaloon carved into the wooden Mongolian script, and she knew Moxie knew how to use it. This was a master bowwoman. Penelope jumped up from her chair, scurried over from behind the table. Uh, m- Miss Carver, she called. The woman stopped in the entranceway. Penelope rushed to her, grabbing a publication on the way. Carver, over her shoulder, said, Pay the grazing fee, Miss Dillashaw. I'll be there shortly. Meekly, she presented Carver with a booklet she'd grabbed. Moxie Breastbine and the Desert Spider, issue number one. Carver didn't take it, looked at it like she was being presented with a used pair of underwear. For Casey, she explained. On the house. It's more age-appropriate than what she was looking at earlier. Carver sighed, opened up the African history textbook, and slipped in between the pages. She's got enough of a potty mouth as it is, Penelope. I know, I'm sorry. I'm sure she'll appreciate it. We'll wait until she passes her first test to give it to her, Carver said, waving the textbook to indicate the tough subject matter they were taught out there. Listen, not to take up too much of your time, Penelope stuttered, but, but, well, you know my cousin's taking over the shop for a little while, and, well, a slight grin from Carver, the first sign of warmth the woman had shown since she'd appeared in the doorway. Kelly tells us you're good with a bow. Real good. You'll do fine, mate. My fingers bled for the first week, Penelope replied, blushing once more. You guys are intense up at Darlot. I'm just... Well, you hear stories. Most of it is just stories, Carver cut in. I can ride from here to Sydney and back and never see a bandit or a slaver or any... She waved the book again. Busty pirates. And you don't believe in worms, do you? It wasn't the slavers or the busty pirates that worried her, and no, it wasn't the worms either. It wasn't even your average Joe Blow bandit. No, what worried her, what had given her a nightmare or two in the past week, was, he's dead, Carver cut in. She quickly clarified herself. I believe, she stressed, that Pedro Kimbers is no longer with the living. That seemed to be the general consensus with everyone Penelope had talked to. The last camel train that came in, she questioned everyone that would talk to her. She'd inquired with various security firms in town, and sent letters out to people she knew in Leonara, Laverton, Sir Samuel, and Painesville. They all reported the same thing. Banditry, when it happened, was more desperate, disorganized, erratic. You didn't see whole trains vanish like they used to. You didn't see special agents from Perth or Alice Springs recovered in the deep desert, naked and wounded and traumatized. You didn't see raids on Carnarvon or Mikathara with mass abductions of women and livestock. That's what people seem to believe, Carver added, among traders like myself, and it's what I believe. Kelly believes it. What do you think happened? Carver shrugged. Bandit kings, I take it, usually don't make it into their golden years. An ambitious lieutenant, one of his sub-commanders, rival warlord, who knows? Great, she grunted. No more united front, I just have to worry about thousands of rival bandit gangs. Carver smirked. I don't think it's thousands, mate. Look, you're only going to Geraldton, right? You'll be fine. Make a killing, eh?